Good morning, everyone. A uh, warm welcome to our time of worship together and devotions. Uh, a big thank you again to Kirsty. Seeing the chat, just looking at it uh, already, there's lots of people expressing gratitude for Kirsty's worship videos. Uh, the uh, Peter Norgate at the beginning. Kirsty, as always, thank you for the worship. Really enjoyed Psalm 63. I absolutely agree. I I loved that. I watched that uh, several times over. Um, so let's just have a minute or two going through the chat, seeing who's here and passing on people's greetings to one another. And as usual, we'll give a second or two for the uh, for the numbers to catch up. So yeah, Peter and Margaret, good morning to you. And of course, you'll see the spanner next to Peter's name. A thank you to our little team of moderators who are helping out and just keeping an eye out on the chat room, make sure everything is, is going well there. Um, Alison Fielding, good morning. I listened to the worship songs and also really enjoyed them. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, Ian and Margaret Lamb, listening to the worship songs now. Brilliant. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, David Belsham, <clears throat> good morning, David. Uh, from Lagmore, so happy to be with you all. It's a great thing for us all to be together, isn't it? Linda and Roger, good morning to you. The Park Elliots and Poppy, I hope your, your signal stays up this morning. Uh, who's next? We've got Fiona McMillan, good morning, everyone. Marion Burrow Smith, good morning from the garden. It is a lovely day out today. Rona Cunningham, good morning, everyone from Mount Vernon in Glasgow. Good morning, Rona. Nice to know we've got a few, we always have a few Glasgow people, and you're always uh, faithfully one of them. We've also got, I think, uh, Peter and Fiona Roger, who normally would be in with us in both at the minute, but I think are, are likely following along this morning as well. <clears throat> uh, good morning from Lenny and Chris. What a glorious morning and a great selection of worship songs again. Thank you, Kirsty. The Dunbars, good morning, everyone. James and Penny, enjoying the music very much. Good morning, everyone from Morag. <laughs> Tim Walker says bear. I'm not sure if, if, if that's a reference. I'm not, I'm, but we'll, see, we'll take that as a good morning from Tim and Helen and Molly listening in. Uh, good morning. Nice to see you this week. Uh, from Beth, good morning. Beth Bullsey. Uh, Maureen, Sunny Carbridge. And Helen Banks also saying it's a lovely and warm, sunny Carbridge. And uh, Gloria Bruce also the three three Carbridge. You know what a beautiful morning Carbridge sounds like the place to be this morning. Maureen <clears throat> in the garden with a nice cup of tea. The birds are singing. That's a beautiful. Uh, yeah, the, the bird song is just lovely, isn't it? Just to sit and otherwise silence and listen only to the sound of the birds is magic. Oh, there's time again. Beautiful morning, great music. Right, beautiful. I'm guessing uh, bear B A U. Or BEA, got it. <laughs> so good morning, good music and worship. Thanks, Kirsty. We've got the Parmenters, Alex, Katrina, Ava, Ben, Gregor, and Jock. Good morning to you. Hope Jock is doing well. I hope you're all doing well. But I hope that, that Jock the dog is is doing well and giving you a lot of pleasure. Dogs are just animals are just magic, aren't they? Helen Banks, I may have to turn the volume up as the doors are open and the birds are so noisy. But some people maybe rather listen to the birds. Beryl Shackleton, uh, thank you, Lord, for such a beautiful day. Absolutely, Beryl. PTL. See, I hadn't forgotten. Ian Forsyth, Ian uh, in Inverness. Ian and Ian. Uh, <clears throat> Ian in Inverness. Cloudy but warm here. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know if we've got many clouds here. I, I, I close the window. If I open the window, the sun shines off the top of my head and it makes me look like I've got a halo, which is not... It's not a good look. So, yes. Um, Peter Hooker, good morning from Kilcott. Gillian and Peter on the mend. That's good to hear. I heard that you have been pretty pretty rubbish uh, health-wise for a week or two, Peter. So that's good that you're recovering. I hope Gillian's not caught it. Jane, good morning, Jane Roxburgh. And good morning from Craig Moore. Helen, good morning to you. Uh, Helen and Derek there. Sue and Dave Bradshaw, good morning. Everyone from Essex. It's a, a beautiful day. Okay, so a beautiful day all over the UK. That's good. Lynn Benj, good morning. Very hot duffel, Carbage. Um, we've got the Blairs, good morning from both of us. Um, and then just Lynn saying to Peter, that glad you're on the mend. Good work, Gillian. And good morning from Kirsty Murphitt and Nemo sitting outside in the garden. Uh, people loving the worship this morning, Kirsty. We've got the Blacks, good morning from Stuart and Barbara. What a lovely day. Claire and Zoe in Sunny Boat of Garden, they're in the kitchen. And then we've got Moira and Lorimer in, in Linmore. Good morning to you too. Good morning, Liz. Sunny Carbridge, Liz and Mum Ray Baxter. Good morning to you. 
and the Ingram family, <clears throat> Roderick McLeod, Nettie Bridge, Kath, Dave, Typing, and Dorothy, and uh, still name isn't it? I was going to say his grand in there, but it's still name Bridge. Uh, Gus and Margaret, and uh, Carbridge, Anne and Roger and Sonny Grantin, uh, Sandra Scott. Good morning, everyone from beautiful morning, Buttergarten, Jimmy, June, and Sandra. We've been looking at the lambs and. Uh, the lambs are, are lovely, a couple of weeks old now, aren't they? But looking great. Wendy and Alex, good morning to you. I don't know what it's like in, in Norway. I don't know if it's as nice a day as we've got here. Get Roland and Mary <coughs> in Haysham. And then James and Frida Grant in Tullock. Good morning to you. Hope that you're doing well and keeping well. Elizabeth Toon, Milton. Sun is almost shining this morning. Well, if everything else is something to go by, then it'll be, it'll be bright and sunny before long. Good morning all from John Dixon. Good morning to you. John Dougal and Emma in Bota Garten, just around the corner. Uh, Pete and Julie and Nethi, good morning from you as well and good morning to you. Joy Cullen, good morning everyone from the Walker Lodging to Abernethy. Joy, Harriet, Neve and Erin, good morning. Um, it's lovely just to have all of these people, all of us able to gather together, isn't it? Uh, days gone by if this kind of thing had happened there would just have been real isolation with no no fellowship no communication it would have been very difficult frank and julia good morning i uh, hope you had a nice time with uh, terry the other day we stopped in here or from a from a socially distant point of view stopped in to, to say hello and said he was on way so and a good morning as well thinking of terry good morning terry and shan and anybody else that is listening on the zoom call who are obviously not able to type into the chat but if you're listening on zoom then we're, we're very pleased that you're all able to join with us as well. So a, a special good morning to you. The Perrys in Cromdale, uh, Andrew Marion, Garden at Milton, another lovely morning. Ian and Joan Murphy in Whitburn, good morning. Uh, Anne and David, one of one of those songs I think this morning, if I remember rightly, Anne, was one of the ones that you had suggested, the one that was from the church in, uh, in Northern Ireland. Yeah, I can't remember. You'll know what one it was, but I'm sure one of those was one of the ones that you had you had requested. Uh, Andy and I ask, morning. Some great dancing has been happening here. Not from Dad, though. I'm not a great dancer either, or indeed a great singer. Um, but yes, that sounds like a, a fun way to start a Sunday morning. Jane Weston, good morning from Carbridge. Uh, the Knots, good morning from Craig Moore. Uh, really glad to hear that Peter is feeling better. Absolutely. And we also have we got Simon Smith. Good morning from Simon and Lisa. Uh, and Gillian, good morning. Oh no, from a very dull Comrie. Thank you for welcoming me into your online church community. Gillian, it's, um, yeah, you don't think of yourself as like an outsider coming in. If you're here this morning, you're, you're very much a part of, of what we're doing, brothers and sisters all across the Lord's kingdom. And we're, we are really blessed that you um, have chosen on some Sunday mornings to, to come along. And yeah, we'll continue to to pray for you and look forward sometime to, to being able to see you again. <clears throat> Just have a little drink of water. <clears throat> Excuse me, right, I think we are up to date with the chat. There aren't any sort of intimations this morning. Carol Gordon is going to come on later and talk to us a little bit about the Scripture Union Appeal. But just in a, a general sense, please remember all, all the Christian organisations, not just in Scotland, but across the world, missionary organisations, persecuted church, who are struggling to communicate the, the love of God just now. And we, we pray for all of them. Uh, as usual this week, we have on Tuesday evening at half past seven our devotions. We will be starting a, a short series of four going through the life of Samson. Samson is one of these characters in the book of Judges in the Old Testament who suffers from having appeared in a lot of, sort of children's stories. And as adults, we tend not to really spend any time in the story. So that's Tuesday at half past seven here on the channel. Thursday night, we have our uh, prayer time where the email goes out at about six o'clock or thereabouts to encourage us all to pray together at seven o'clock just in our own homes. And a short video devotion goes on the YouTube channel around about the same time. And we've been going through the Lord's Prayer. So anybody can tune in and, and see the, the video. They're, they're on the channel under a, a, a playlist entitled, I think it's Thursday Prayer Time. And if you want the email for that, the, the email that goes along with it, with the prayer needs, then please just get in touch, uh, either with me or anybody who, can, who will forward it on to me. And if you have a prayer request, please submit that and remember to get a consent from whoever 
is that you're asking to pray for before any prayer needs or names particularly go out and about. And then there's the home groups on Thursday evenings. I think they're all sort of settled on 8 o'clock. I might be wrong on that, but they're they're all around anyway. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little croaky this morning. I think that's us up to date with the chat. We'll keep an eye on that. And as I say, we've got a little group of moderators who are very diligent in watching over it. Uh, to the to the boys and girls, I'm going to try and change a, or show you a, a different screen here. <clears throat> right, I'm hoping you can see that and that you can also still hear me. I've got another screen open here that will, all being well, tell me if the chat suddenly fills up with people saying we can't see anything and we can't we can't hear you. So if you look at that statue, we're thinking a bit about statues this morning. Uh, nothing at all to do with the way that statues are currently in the news. But that statue is quite an unusual one. And if you look at the top part of it, so it's, a, it's actually a fountain. It's a statue on the top of a fountain. And if you look on the top of it, you'll see the lady who looks pretty much like a lot of other statues and fountains that we are familiar with. But rather than holding something which you would normally find this top, top of a statue, she is holding a big bug there. Can you see that? And we should be able to zoom in on it. Right. It's not actually a very attractive thing to find on top of a, a statue, but that is actually a bull weevil. That's B-O-L-L, -L, <clears throat> a bull weevil. And the statue is in a town in America called Enterprise, and it's in the state of... Alabama. And there's a story behind why that statue is there and why it's such an unusual thing to find on top of a statue. It's the only statue I know of that has a, a bug on the top of it. I can't think of many statues that exist to to bugs, to, do, to honor and remember bugs and beetles and things. The ball weevil attacks, let me show you this, cotton. So in Alabama, and this is about 100 years ago, the farmers there used to make their money from growing cotton. And just as you see on the field there, and people would go through the fields and then machines would go through the fields. They would gather up the cotton, they would sell it, they would get money, and that's how they lived. That's how they made their money. The, the boll weevil went to Alabama. It's not from Alabama originally. It sounds like it went on holiday there. It arrived in Alabama from Mexico and it started to destroy all the cotton. So the farmers had a big fight in their hands. They were trying to work out how can we still make money when we've got this horrible little bug that has come in and it started to destroy all the cotton and they didn't know what to do. And it looked like the whole town was going to have a really rubbish time because they weren't going to have any money anymore because they weren't going to have any cotton to sell because of the ball weevil. However, what happened was some of the farmers said, well, if we, can't, if we can't grow cotton without this little bug coming along and eating it all and destroying it all, if we can't make any money from cotton, what we should do is we should, we should look at other things that we can grow that the boll weevil won't eat. And so they started to grow other things and they started to get peanuts and they started to grow coffee and they started to grow a whole load of different varieties of crops and the boll weevil didn't eat any of those things. And it turned out that the farmers were able to make more money and more income and have a better life from growing all of these other things than they had been from being able to grow the cotton. So in the end, they realized that the boll weevil coming and destroying all the cotton, although it seemed like a really bad thing at the time, although it felt like a really sore and difficult thing at the time, the bull weevil coming and destroying all the cotton was actually a really good thing because it forced them to find other ways to make their income, other ways to farm, and it made the whole area <clears throat> a lot better off at the, end of the, at the end of the harvests than they normally had been in the years before. And so in order to honor the, the bull weevil, they built that statue. That's it. That's a fairly ugly wee picture. I found it. I found a rather nice picture of a bull weevil. Look at that. 
doesn't he look quite nice? I think he looks quite friendly. I mean, it's it's good that he's not the size of a dog. That that would be a bit creepy. But I think that that's quite a nice wee picture. You would have a cuddly toy of that in your bedroom, right? You could sit and stroke it and cuddle it at night. Maybe not with the big long kind of snout thing. But that's the bull weevil. And so to honour the bull weevil, and bizarrely to give thanks to the bull weevil and for the bull weevil, they built a statue. And the statue still stands there. And every time the people look at it, they remember that sometimes things can feel really bad, sometimes things can feel really unpleasant, and you think, oh no, this has gone all wrong. But actually, it can turn out to be a real blessing and a really positive thing. And that's the same useful reminder to us in our in our lives and in our Christian faith. Sometimes bad things can lead on to blessings. And we think that some event has only created maybe uncertainty and sadness, but actually the Lord through it is doing something that we can only see later on and that works out ultimately for our good. So that's the bull weevil. Let me see if I can get this all back to normal. Uh, let's just stop sharing, that might work. I think that's us. Let's pray together. God of blessing, our hearts praise you and our innermost souls exalt your name because you are God and the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. You have commanded us to pray always with all supplication and thanksgiving and we know that our prayers can be weak. We sometimes struggle to articulate the emotions and the desires and the thoughts that we have in our hearts. And so it is a great comfort to know that you have appointed for us a great high priest who even now sits at your right hand, who even now perfects our stuttering and sometimes weak prayers before you. And it is in his name that we come this morning boldly to your throne. Wherever, wherever we are in body, we are before your throne in spirit, expecting to find, as we have found so many times before, mercy and grace and love and help and support. Lord, every spiritual need that we have, you have more than fulfilled. We have your son who was given for our sins to work our salvation, to break the power of sin in our lives. We have the spirit who continues to comfort and direct us and who helps us as we read your word to draw closer to you. Father, that word is so precious to us. We remember times that you have truly revealed yourself to us through that word in times of need, in times of desperation, in times of spiritual renewal, in times of, of growth, both the good times and the bad. Your word has been to us an oasis of strength and refreshment. And as you brought the children of Israel through 40 years in the wilderness to the promised land and sustained them with the manna and the water, so your word and your spirit are to us that same sustenance as we journey through this world, through our, or towards our promised land. And we need that guidance. We need it, especially just now. We need its corrective influence. We need to renew ourselves constantly in your service. And so we ask this morning that you would let us see you afresh. Lift that veil a little again, that we might see and marvel and worship. Remember the, the vision that you gave to John in Revelation. We ask that we would get a single glimmer of that this morning, who heard and a voice is thunder, Alleluia, for our God, the Almighty, reigns. So we ask, Father, that you would remain with us, be pleased with our time together this morning, for we offer ourselves once again in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, with my Bible over there. <clears throat> We're going to read this morning in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. So I'll give you a little second, anybody who wants to, to look that up. This is just a sort of one-off. My plan is from next week that we'll do just a short four weeks in the book of Ruth, which is a, a great Old Testament story. But this morning we're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 1, and we're going to read to halfway through chapter 2. And if you have trouble finding Nehemiah, uh, of course the good news is it's immediately after Ezra. Okay, that's probably not much help at all. It's about a third of the way through, just after a third of the way through. 
A good tip if you've got a Bible and you're not sure where something is, if you open your Bible right in the middle, likelihood is that you'll be in the Psalms. And if you go back a little ways from the Psalms through Job and uh, Esther, you'll get to, to Nehemiah. <clears throat> So, Nehemiah chapter 1 at verse 1. Nehemiah, I should say, is sometimes billed as being uh, the shortest guy in the Bible, Nehemiah. But of course, once you read Job, you realize that in Job there is somebody shorter than Nehemiah, and that billed at the shoe height. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. We have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and will bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, <clears throat> in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence before, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing as you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. The king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? When will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. The king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Amen. And uh, as always, we ask God's blessing on his word. Uh, one or two people just added to the chat. <clears throat> um, Donald McGregor, morning, late as usual, but here, here is the important thing. Good morning, Donald and Alex. Norway's coming out of lockdown. Thank you. So, Nehemiah, um, as we all start to move slowly out of lockdown, uh, of course, that might take some considerable period of time, but it's important to remind ourselves that church is not during this time in a state of, of being suspended. Uh, so whatever we're going to do moving forward, it's not a matter of rebuilding something that has been destroyed, but building something that perhaps is slightly different from the way that it was before, as social distancing might be something that's part of our lives now for, for some time. But whatever it looks like, 
Uh, this time and the time to follow need to be characterized by a concern for how we put the glory of God or keep the glory of God at the center and put it above all other things within the church. Now, here's a tip. If you ever want to enter world domination, this is a good technique. When you invade a country, identify the leaders and remove them. Take them away. Take away all the ones who are wise, the respected individuals, because they are the ones, if you want to control another country, another people group, they are the ones who will be a threat to your control because they can lead the population to revolt and ultimately to claim back their country. That is what Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah in the 6th century BC, and in order to easily control the population, he took away a lot of people, including the smartest ones, who might be that kind of danger, and he took them all to Babylon, where he had come from. He was a, the Babylonian king. That's known in the history of Israel and in the Bible as the period of the, the exile, where a lot of the population of Judah were carted off to Babylon. Uh, a lot of the prophets in the Old Testament, a lot of the prophecies that we enjoy reading are directed to the people who were during the time of exile in Babylon. A lot of the Psalms were written through the, the suffering of the people there. The best known one, Psalm 3-7, uh, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. Our tormentors required of us a song. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? The people are, are in exile. And God, had, through the prophets, told the people that this would happen to them. And he had promised them that after 70 years in exile, this was through the prophet Jeremiah, after 70 years in exile, they would be restored. But whatever happened to them, they were reassured that they were not abandoned. But it was a terrible time. The temple of Jerusalem, that, that jewel and the crown of, of the people of God, was raised to the ground, the center of religious life for the Israelites. The treasures were carried off to the Babylonian temples. The whole country was really reduced to little more than a remote province of the Babylonian Empire, and its ruling structures were all dismantled. As the years passed, however, the Persians rose to prominence. They overtook the Babylonians as the dominant superpower. And so Nehemiah finds himself in the court of the Persian king, who is sort of taken over from Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, the Babylonians. Um, he's in the court of Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And by this point, the Lord is now beginning to restore the people back to their homeland. The month of Kislev, the chapter 1, verse 1 starts, is really the equivalent of a sort of November, December. So we know that we're talking here, we can be quite specific, sort of November 445 BC. Nehemiah is doing pretty well for himself. He's the cupbearer to the king. And Hanani, who is one of the ones who's been left in Judah, he comes to visit from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah, in the absence of Twitter or Facebook or, or social media or the BBC or anything like that, quizzes Hanani as to how things are going back in Jerusalem, back in the Lord's city, how are, how are things going? And it shows, I think, that inquiry, the kind of man that Nehemiah was, that he doesn't display his success to his visitors. You no, know, he doesn't say, come on, Hannah, look how well I'm doing. I've risen to the to the very top. I'm at the right hand of the king. I've got the best, you know, the best chariot in town and the best stereo system and you know of, of the day. He's got all of the best stuff, but he's not interested in displaying his success. As soon as Hanani comes, he he just wants to know how are things going back in Jerusalem? How are things going back in the Lord's the Lord's city? So although he's got wealth and status and rank and privilege, he's only interested in how things are going back in Jerusalem. And the news is awful from Hanani. The people, he says, are in great distress. There has been famine. Many of them have actually sold themselves into slavery or their families into slavery, a desperate situation. This is a, um, a collation of some scripture verses that I've kind of put together just to give you an idea of the devastation that the people of God had experienced during this time of, of exile. The nursing, sorry, the tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. Children beg for food. No one gives it to them. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of this hunger who waste away. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They have become food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. We have become orphans, fatherless. Our mothers are like widows. 
Our pursuers and at our necks were weary, were given no rest. Slaves rule over us. There is no one to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. So this is serious devastation and catastrophe to the people of Israel. And when Nehemiah hears it, he, he's broken by it. His response, as you'll see there in verse 4, I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So he weeps and mourns and he turns himself to prayer. And from his prayer, you can see clearly he understood that the exiles or the exile itself had been the Lord's doing. And it was done because of the unfaithfulness of Israel. And so part of his prayer, a large part of his prayer, is a prayer for forgiveness <clears throat> and restoration. It pierces him, <clears throat> excuse me, it pierces him that the city where the Lord had put his name is now lying in ruins of this jewel of Israel, which had once been the glory of the whole region, is, is reduced pretty much to rubble. And so that plea, a plea, a plea of forgiveness, but a plea to the faithfulness of God, where he says, you told us, you told us through Moses, you told us if we sinned, we would be scattered. But you also told us that if we came back to you, then we would be restored. And that no matter where we were, no matter how far we had been scattered, we would be restored. So Nehemiah, knowing God and knowing God's word, his assumption is that as he prays, this is a God who will keep his promises. And that's what he prays, that you will now keep that promise of bringing us back together from the places to which we've been scattered. He is determined when he hears about Jerusalem to do something about it, to see God's city and God's people restored. And so he starts to pray and the prayer generally for the situation, but also specifically that he would have success with the king and his desire to go and do something to try and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, it's worth noting <clears throat> that chapter two begins in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took out the wine and gave it to the king. And that's when he gets his opportunity. So it tells us that that's in the month of Nisan. The month of Nisan is March into April. So chapter two begins by telling us that in Nisan, he gets his opportunity with the king. That's four months later, four months between Hanani giving him the news of the devastation of Jerusalem and Nehemiah getting his opportunity that he's been praying for to do something about it. We've mentioned many times that names in scripture are names have significance. Hakaliah, which is the name of Nehemiah's father, Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. Any, any name that ends in that ayah sound like Isaiah and Jeremiah, that's the name of God, Yahweh. Um, so they mean something. Hakaliah's name means wait for the Lord. And that's what Nehemiah had to do. He hears the tragic report. He weeps and mourns and fasts and prays. But he has to wait four months before the Lord gives him any kind of opportunity to do something about it. Now, you can't fast for four months. You'd be dead. As far as I know, and I'm willing to be corrected on it as far as i know the most that a human body can go without food is about 40 days about the time that that jesus went fasting in the wilderness but you can't weep for four months you would you would break down you would you would fall apart and besides he says in chapter 2 verse 1 that he has not been sad in the presence of the king before so god has comforted him his own name name nehemiah means the lord Comforts. So every time someone talks to him, every time someone says, Nehemiah, come over here, or Nehemiah, can you do this? Or the king asks, Nehemiah, can I have wine? Every time that happens, he hears the Lord comforts, the Lord comforts, the Lord comforts. So four months he's had to live wanting to go back to Jerusalem. You see, he had a passion for God's work. He had committed to seeing it done. He was praying for it. But he got on with his life. He met his responsibilities. He persevered all the while that he was continuing to pray and he waited for God. And with one man, Nehemiah, who had that passion and determination 
to see God's will done on God's timescale, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt in only 52 days. That means that Nehemiah spent double the amount of time in praying for the opportunity than he actually spent rebuilding the walls themselves. We can often be in a real hurry to, to do the work for God. And what sometimes we need to learn is to wait upon God. And waiting doesn't mean doing nothing. During the waiting time, the work is prayer. That's work that nobody sees, that no one applauds, and that perhaps no one other than God will ever be aware of. But he shows that willingness to wait for the Lord, to give him or to, for the Lord to give him the right timing, not to rush him. He knew that God had a schedule and that God had a plan and that it was more important to find his place within that plan than it was just to set off by himself. So he has this determination to rebuild the city of God for the glory of God. As he goes forward, there will be challenges. He will have to deal with malcontents amongst the builders. There will be strikes. There will be challenges in the physical getting of the buildings constructed, the organizing, the safe passage. There's governments to negotiate with. There will be saboteurs. There are individuals, individuals who are trying to put spanners in the works. But the work went on. And because he waited for God, the work was done, as I said, in only 52 days. Now, there's a difference. And I think this highlights the difference very well between emotions and passion. If you talk to people who have visited areas of, of great need uh, around the world, you know, people who come back from areas of great need. After they come back, they, of course, have a strong emotional attachment to that work that they have participated in and the needs that they have seen. And we all know that to greater or lesser extents. So we've experienced <clears throat> that kind of thing ourselves. But for many people, over time, that initial <clears throat> intensity can fade because Emotions are fickle, they're unpredictable, they're liable to change. But that's different from a person who has a passion for a work, a passion to see God's name exalted, a passion perhaps to see preachers equipped to, to share the gospel in China or, or Nepal or to see the scriptures made available to children in India or Africa, some in terms that they can relate to and, and understand. And it's the passion that gets the work done because passion like that, a passion for the glory of God and for the work of God and for the gospel around the world, the passion never dies. It doesn't evaporate like the initial emotional response that we can have. And what, he, what Nehemiah has was not just an emotional response when Hanani gives him the news and then he settles back into to a normal life that is, is unchanged when that emotional response fades. What Nehemiah has is a passion for the Lord's work. And that's where that perseverance comes from after the initial emotion passes. And it's that passion that pleads with God, that waits for God. And then when the window of opportunity opens, serves God. So for ourselves, let's not be impatient, but let's be determined. And let's commit ourselves to prayer and to waiting and watching for the right time. Because Nehemiah finishes, or the section that we read halfway through chapter two, the king granted me what I asked, not because of his emotional state, not because of his persistence, but because the good hand of my God was upon me. Let's pray. Lord God, there are so many things that we want to do for your kingdom. There are so many things that we want to see achieved and we ask simply that you would give us in our current situation uh, the patience to wait upon you you would give us the determination to see that work done but to see it done on your time scale we pray that we would be being men and women of prayer that we would be getting to know much more of the kind of life that nehemiah must have lived for these four months where he has that passion he has that frustration of not being able to do it he has the vision for what he wants to see but he has the willingness to know that your time is always the right time. So give us patience and give us wisdom and let us uh, let us go forward, but go forward in your will, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> now, I mentioned earlier uh, that Carol Gordon, I'll bring Carol in just now. 
Good morning, Carol. Good morning. I'll widen it a little bit so we can, there we go, it's a better, a better view. How are you in uh, Nethu this morning? Yes, all good in there. Thank you, Graham. The sun's still shining, but I've decided that I should be indoors. It helps me concentrate. <laughs> Yeah, well, at least, at least you, you don't have a shiny head like I do. So you can be outdoors if you want to and not dazzle people. So I'm going to remove myself from the screen and you're going to tell us a little bit about the Scripture Union Appeal and then lead us in our, in our prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Well, good morning, everybody. As I said already, I'm in sunny Nethy Bridge and it is a beautiful morning that just helps us all to feel better. Um, you had an email from Lorimer and he highlighted in that that at Abernethy Church throughout the year, we give to various Christian ministries. And the ministry that we would be giving to at the moment, if we we're meeting together, would be Scripture Union. And the reason for that is that we are in a time leading up to the summer holidays when Scripture Union are particularly at work, uh, running camps, running holiday clubs. And um, they have a very busy program over the summer. And there's an opportunity to give specifically to sponsor children going to SU camp that might not be able to have the means to do so. Scripture Union have a very big reach. So they work in um, the top boarding schools in Scotland, running SU groups there, but they also work in uh, inner city communities uh, where life is very difficult. And so they have a broad reach into um, the lives of children and young people from all kinds of backgrounds. And many are just not able to go to camp and therefore uh, giving can help children have an opportunity that they might not have been able to have. Scripture Union, I'm sure is familiar to many of us this morning. It might be interesting at the end just to put on the chat what your link with SU is. I went to camp when I was 12. Um, it was probably the biggest adventure at that time. Um, it was just incredible to go away and it impacted me greatly. And SU's remained uh, part of my life for over 40 years. Um, SU's mission is to introduce people, uh, children and young people to Jesus, to the claims of Christ and to explore the Bible and what it has to say. And they do that in a relevant and a creative way through schools ministry and through the camps and the holiday clubs. And many, many young people come to faith through the work of Scripture Union. But there are lots of people who don't actually um, complete that journey of faith until much later in life. But SU has a big impact on their lives. Many young people also find communities within SU groups and at camp um, and at holiday clubs where they experience a love from other people and an acceptance for who they are and people that are really interested in them and that care for them. And so SU's ministry um, is not just about bringing people into the kingdom of God, but it's also to love and to care and to help our children and young people. As you can imagine at this time, it's really hard because you, um, with lockdown, children aren't going to school, all the camps and holiday clubs have been cancelled, um, other big events in the central belt that are big youth events that happen through Scripture Union, and so all these have um, had to be cancelled, and the SU team are working tirelessly night and day to get some work um, online so that young people can go to camp virtually, they can go to holiday clubs, they can meet in groups through Zoom, and that contact uh, won't be lost. But that's really difficult because there's a whole issue with safeguarding. And as I'm sure uh, many of you are aware, working online with children and young people has real dangers. And so it's very, very challenging for groups like Scripture Union to get systems in place. They've lost lots of their income stream from camps not happening, but also the centres that SU own throughout Scotland. Um, they're lying empty. They still require maintenance. Um, you don't just stop spending money on them because they're closed. And so like every charity, as Graham has said, it's a really challenging time. So Lorimer attached a PDF um, about with information um, about how you might give to Scripture Union. 
very easy to give. And on the chat, the, the link will come up so that you've got that. You can literally just click on the link with your credit card and give a donation. And I, I hope that's something that you'll consider doing this morning. We're quite creative at uh, Abernethy Church. We sometimes have muffins and coffees and do different things to encourage people to give. We can't do that um, just now, but we would like to encourage you to think about giving a gift to help the work of Scripture Union. And um, you can find out more about it. You can go on the SU uh, website, or as I say, you can read the letter that Lorimer has attached um, in his email yesterday. SU don't just need our financial giving, they need our prayers as well. We are in challenging times and the team at SU are dealing with stuff they've never had to deal with before. Just, I'm sure, um, like most uh, of you, they're struggling with the technology and actually all our young people are much more competent uh, with technology than uh, leaders and um, so it, it's difficult. Please pray for the work of SU. And again, on that letter, there are specific prayer points. In our prayers of intercession today, we're going to particularly pray for the children and young people of our world. And so I'd ask you now to join with me in prayer as we bring our children and young people before the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord God Almighty, your love reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the skies. Thank you that we can come before your throne in confidence this morning. Thank you that we can come and lift up the children and young people of our world, our cities, and even our villages here in Scotland. Thank you that you know every child by name. Heavenly Father, that's such a difficult concept for us to get our head round. But actually, you know every child. You know the number of hairs on their head. You love them and you care for them. And your heart breaks for the situations that you see many of them are in. The Bible refers to the importance of protecting children and you call us to care for them and not see them as insignificant. Children and young people are valuable to you. But in many cultures around the world, children are often abused, neglected and discarded. They may be sold for profit into the sex industry or sold as slaves to work in the most dreadful conditions. Heavenly Father, you see their situation. You know where they are today. And we just ask that you would move in our world this day that you would have your people in the right places to help alleviate these children's sufferings. We know that at this time in our history, particularly with this pandemic, more children are suffering in the most terrible of ways and we just lift them before you. We pray for the parents who are struggling to put food on the table and who often give up their children. We cannot imagine that but we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would move in these situations. Your heart breaks to see them suffer, and we ask that somehow there will be an end to child slavery and trafficking in our world. We pray today for all the organizations that are working in this area to bring an end to this kind of suffering. And we think particularly of the individuals who are daily exposed to the horror of man's depravity as they seek out the culprits of these dreadful crimes and they see the horror of what happens. Heavenly Father, would you protect these people? Would you protect their minds? And would you help them not to be harmed by what they see? We know that it's not just children in faraway places who suffer abuse and are living in poverty. Many here in Scotland and indeed even in our valley are suffering too. And we ask that all of us may be sensitive to the needs in our neighbourhoods. Help us to be vigilant. Help us to keep our eyes open and to look out for families that may be struggling to cope with life. 
help us to see children who may be suffering behind closed doors. Help us to be bold enough to take action if we see things that we think are not right. Help us to be sensitive to the needs of the children that are all around us. And Heavenly Father, we want to pray particularly today for our own young people as they come to terms with all that's happened with the COVID lockdown. We pray for them with regard to their schooling and the lack of face-to-face -face interaction with their friends and family members. Help us to be sensitive to their feelings of loss as they end the school term without all the fun of summer activities. Heavenly Father, we pray particularly for those transitioning from P7 to senior school and those who are leaving school forever. So many endings will not happen and there'll be much sadness and disappointment and feelings of loss. Help us all to respond appropriately to them and to collectively help our local children and young people and their parents at this time. Help us to show that we care. And we pray that you'd help us to be creative as communities, to be able to do things that will meet the needs of our young people and help us to take collective responsibility for their well-being. May our young people here in the Valley feel loved and valued and cared for. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this morning for the tremendous outpouring of care and support that we have seen in our communities. We ask you for help to continue this and to truly love our neighbor as ourselves. Thank you that so many have been your hands and feet during this pandemic. Help us to continue this. May we be changed forever as a result of what's happened. Changed forever in a good and positive way. And may our villages and communities flourish as a result of what's happened as we go forward. Gracious and loving God, thank you that we can, see, can intercede for others. Thank you that we can stand in the gap this morning. Thank you that we can bring the children of our world, our cities and our village before you. And thank you that we can be confident that you have heard our prayer and that you will take action. And so we leave our prayers with you, and we do that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for, for your prayer, but also what you said about um, Scripture Union, because uh, I'm sure people will know that I'm one of those people that owes a, a deep personal debt to, to Scripture Union. And as you said, it's a, a lifeline for a lot of young people who uh, just don't find really anybody else in life that genuinely cares for them. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll let you go and enjoy thank your you. lunch, family. Um, there we go. So as Carol said there, if you wanted to mention anything about your own thoughts on, on Scripture Union, what Scripture Union has meant to you, some of the, the young people that I met, they, I can't believe what they call them now, they used to call them urban priority camps, but uh, they, they, they would grow up and say that the only real positive memories they have of childhood is to the Scripture Union. So one or two comments on the, the chat. Um, Harriet, happy inner and outer sunshine to you all. I enjoyed this morning. And Gordon Brown, thanks for being reminded of Isaiah 40, 31. Those who wait upon the Lord, that's the verse, they shall rise on wings like eagles um, and renew their strength nicely on wings like eagles. Um, so we'll leave the chat open for a little bit for anybody who wants to, to comment or to ask questions or to share a, a thought or a memory from Scripture Union. I'm sure there are lots of people who have supported Scripture Union. Andrew, amen. Many thanks, Carol. Amen is, is such an important thing to say at the end of a prayer. It, it means truly. When Jesus says, you know, truly, truly, I say to you, the word he's using is amen, amen, I say to you. Or an old translation, what's the word? Verily, 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 I say unto thee. Amen, amen, I say unto you. 
Thank you, Carol. Really like your phrase, stand in the gap. <clears throat> That's from, from Judith. I forget the exact reference. I think it's Ezekiel 20. But yeah, I searched for a man among them who was standing in the gap, but I found none. Good call to prayer. <clears throat> So I don't think, if I really look, I don't think that um, we've had so many work for the moderators to do. I don't always see it. So if if you have, uh, be sure just to uh, let me know, because we, we shouldn't really, the reason we were getting the odd thing like that was because it was appearing in the wrong channels, and hopefully that's been dealt with. <clears throat> so it would just be interesting to know if, if you have had anything to deal with, let me know. Helen Banks, uh, for the, the message and the praise. <clears throat> Could you please explain? Are Judah and Israel the same place? Thank you. Uh, no, they're they're not. Um, so if if you imagine, in fact, I can show you on I can show you on a map. Hang on a second. Um, let me see if I can find a good map. Otherwise, it's always a little bit easier if you can. Demonstrate it with a picture. All right. <clears throat> okay, I have a Bible map here that's really of not much use because it's not giving me a picture with Israel and Judah marked on it. Right, I'll try this one. Okay, the problem is I can't see what I'm doing there. Right. <clears throat> so this is Israel. This is really not working at all, is it? But if this is Israel, you may see that little bit down there is called Judah. The, the Edom and Moab are not Israel, so it's this part here. Israel and Judah. So... <clears throat> Way back in the early books of the Old Testament, there, there was a man called Jacob, and God changed the name of Jacob to Israel, and Israel means he who wrestles with God. So <clears throat> Israel had then 12 sons, and those 12 sons pretty much became the heads of 12 tribes. One of those tribes, or one of those sons was a, a man called Judah, and the 12 tribes inhabited the land of Canaan, and that they changed the name of the land of Canaan to the land of Israel. And each of the tribes took a, a short section. Well, there was never a, there were two sons that didn't. Levi never had land, and Dan never had land. But there were, there were these tribes that made up the land of Israel. One of them was called Judah, and another one was called Benjamin. And at some point during the, the history of Israel, they had the, the kingship of David. But then David's son Solomon and Solomon's son Rehoboam became kings afterward. And under the reign of King Rehoboam, 10 of the tribes decided that they were going to go their own way. And they, they were all in the north and they became or continued to use the name Israel. And the two tribes in the south, that was Judah and Benjamin, uh, they also went their own way. Jerusalem was in Judah. And Judah and Benjamin together became known as, as Judah. So you've got really two nations now. You've got Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Now, Israel had a series of really bad kings, really godless kings. And Judah, by and large, had a series of kings who were much better, who were much more concerned with the, the glory of God. Nehemiah, when it gets to his point in history, Israel has at that time largely already been destroyed, ransacked. Uh, not, dis not destroyed, it, it survived. But that was by the Assyrians. So when Nebuchadnezzar comes, and uh, the Babylonians and Nehemiah's time, well, that was that was Judah. So Israel's ten tribes in the north, and Judah was the two tribes in the south. I hope that didn't sound too lecturish. I hope it was reasonably, reasonably clear. Um, but yes, thank you for for that question. Um, so Judah and Israel are not not the same uh, because they, they split off. Matt saying that he really enjoyed the jokes. 
Uh, thank you, Matt. I always enjoy your uh, your music, the things that you've, you've played. And I, I don't know if you know this, but I was in a band once. We were called the Sewing Machines, but we had to we had to break up because we couldn't afford a singer. <laughs> <clears throat> then we have a, a band called the Doovies. We mostly did covers. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, okay, maybe we'll, we'll let people chuckle away at that. There was, was also a band called the Radiators. We were we were really just a warm up act. Anyway, let's let's leave that one. <clears throat> and uh, our, our new band, Missing Cat. We've probably seen our posters around. Anyway, let's get on. So, Gloria, uh, just enjoyed being here this morning. <clears throat> uh, Wendy, thank you. Best wishes from Wendy at, at Fairview. Nice to see you uh, in the chat, Wendy. And Lynn, uh, I've enjoyed being here. And, um, well, a great message for SU and prayers. Yeah, so something really special to, to take away. Uh, Gillian and Murray, thank you for tuning in. One of the, the great things about this time is um, distance, which is often so such a big barrier is now is now kind of done away with. So whether you are next door or whether you are a hundred miles away, we can we can worship together in this format. And although we all miss being physically together in the same place, that's a, a wonderful thing. Uh, to give the scripture union by card, this is Carol, by card or PayPal, Go to SU Scotland website, click on the menu and click the donate button or use the link given in Lorimer's email. I'll try after this, this video takes a little bit of time to go on live on the channel, but I'll put that in the description as well, the Scripture Union Scotland website. Um, so and I weren't sure if it was a linguistic rather than a geographical difference. No, it, it was a it was a geographical. And of course, all sort of changes. But one of the fascinating things about Israel, and we'll, we'll maybe look at this at some point in more detail, is when you think of all the empires that surrounded Israel. So you had the you know the Egyptian Empire, the, the Assyrians, the Syrians, the Babylonians. You had the Macedonians, the Greeks, the Romans. All of these were superpowers that surrounded the nation of Israel, and yet all of these nations, all of these empires, have now gone, and the only one that exists in anything like its original form is Israel. And yet there is no point in history, if you could get in a TARDIS and go back there, there's no point in history where you would have found anybody that would be able or would have believed that, other than maybe the time of David when Israel did quite well. Every other time Israel were the minnows, and yet Israel is the only one that has, that has survived, that has outlived all of these mighty empires. Happy memories. This is uh, Len and Chris. Happy memories of Scripture Union classes in the local primary school when our children were young. Um, Andrew Mariam, thanks for the explanation. Thanks to, to everyone who's been involved. Uh, have a great Sunday. Thank you, Andrew. Have a, a great Sunday. We pray on for you at the centre. Uh, I know that it's a difficult time for a lot of businesses and a lot of difficult decisions are are, are being made and, and communicated. So we, we pray for all of you at the, at the centre and in the organisation. Andy Nice, the largest person in the Bible, perhaps the woman of Samaria. <laughs> That's pretty good. I thought I had heard all of them by now, the woman of Samaria. I, I can't imagine that she would uh, she would have liked being referred to as that, but that's quite good. So from Bill Dad to Shuhai to the woman of Samaria. <laughs> Let's see here. Is the chat drying up? <clears throat> We're down it. We get sixty-six people in there. <clears throat> and I think, <clears throat> excuse me. My pint of water drying up is probably a, a sign that everything else is drying up. The chat as well. So I will put that scripture union. Link in the below the video. So if you if you forget, if you, I mean if you Google it, it comes up SU Scotland. But I'll put it down below as well. And other than that, Tuesday evening, half past seven, with Thursday prayer time. Let me know if you want to be included on in the list. And the home groups are, I think, all at eight o'clock. And that I think is is us for this morning. So thank you so much for for sharing worship with with us. 
um, whoever you are <clears throat> and wherever you come from, it's such a blessing to me to know that we're all we're all together and that we all have the same end. We're all uh, putting, pulling in the same direction. So every blessing and enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week.